How are we doing, folks? We're going to get into Matthew lesson number four, I believe it is. Savior, mediator, high priest, and king. In order to do that, we need to clear our conscience away, make sure if there's any sin in our life, we wash ourselves clean. We do that by taking a moment of silent prayer and asking forgiveness of sins and name and cite the sins, basically. Um, and we're going to do that. And also, we're going to keep those in prayer in... Uh, I guess the YouTube family uh, got shot up a couple of hours ago. I haven't put it all together. I caught a little bit and piece on the news. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea what it's about, unfortunately. I, uh, if you look at my predictions, um, this is the kind of stuff I was talking about. Like I said, I don't know. This is probably a jilted lover that's upset with uh, their boyfriend or girlfriend. So it looks like it's something like that, which is craziness. But... Um, I would rather it be something like that. I hate to say this, but in the world we live in today, I'd rather it be something like that, that we can put our finger on, than some kind of random shooting or terrorist attack that later on looks like a false flag, which I've gotten into on this page and a lot of you people know about. So it doesn't appear that way. We're going to keep it in prayer. So every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Let's get filled with the Spirit to learn Bible doctrine and also to keep those folks in California at YouTube in prayer. Father, we ask that you bless this message we're about to receive. And Father, send your, your powerful blessings, your powerful hand out to the family and friends out there on YouTube that are working there, that are struggling right now with some type of attack. Father, we're asking you to heal those that need healing. And Father, this is an opportunity for to wake those up that haven't heard the gospel. Maybe they see a page like this, or maybe they've heard about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And now, today is the time to believe. We ask all these things through his precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, still fighting the cold, but I'm feeling a little bit better. So we're going to get into Matthew Lesson 4. And like I said, this is Savior, Mediator, High Priest, and King. I touched on a little bit last lesson. We left off uh, highlighting the importance of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming as the Savior, Mediator, High Priest, and King. Four important titles, but more so they are pertinent as to fulfilling the plan of God from the perspective of prophecy and also the completion of the angelic warfare, God's, God's plan, what's going on behind the scenes that a lot of people don't understand. These four titles, these four important titles, are really uh, key to understand for believers. So, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came in human form to fill these four roles, and importantly, every aspect of these four roles. Runs very deep. These couple of messages I'm touching on, these, these four titles, would not even dig deep enough to get into all of it, but I'm going to give you enough for your own personal studies. As Savior, we have briefly covered Savior. Obviously, on this page, I got into uh, salvation, soteriology, but, and even the last couple of messages. And it's the most common title, the one most people are connected when they think about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They say Savior, and they are correct with that. I even went into the fact that there is only one mediator, last message, between God and man, and that is the unique one of the universe, yes, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the only mediator we have. So in this lesson, let, look, we're going to look at the other two titles, and we're going to still touch on the, the first two, Savior and Mediator, but we need to look at the other two to close it out. And we're left off here on the last lesson, I believe Hebrews 10, 11 was one of the last slides I used with you guys, if you have your notes. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. And I mentioned to you guys last time, this is a fact, man is useless concerning sins. No flawed creature can stand before the justice of God. Man is useless concerning the sin issue, right? We are the problem. The Levitical priests of the Old Testament were a shadow of the true priest who came later on. So we looked at these different things last message. I want to touch on them a little bit more. I'm going to have you guys turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2 with me. And, and the problem is many denominations do not stress these four titles that I've mentioned to you, they don't touch on them. Religion often is, is nothing more than a satanic counterfeit, and I've used that term often, and it's a fact, a satanic counterfeit. Man-made religion will have you believe different things. They'll lead you in a different direction. Nothing in human flesh can save or forgive human sin. Nothing in human flesh can save or forgive human sin. No action, no deed, nothing a, a man or a woman, or for that matter, an angel can do to save you from sin. And face the justice of God. So keep that in mind. Philippians chapter 2. We'll start right off with verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who, although he existed in the form of God. 
did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Philippians 2, 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Philippians 2, 9, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. If you're looking at uh, Philippians 2, 5, in Hebrews 12, 2, it says the joy set before him. He was willing to endure the pain in the cross. The joy set before him was you and I. We need to have this attitude. Others, right? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took us into account. He had that, he had that attitude about us. And we need to have an attitude about others. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So we know the joy set before him in Hebrews 12 too. The reason he went to the cross was for us. I mean, think about that. Jesus Christ is God, but was willing to set that aside to become human. Willing to set that power aside to become human, to become our Savior, our mediator, our high priest, and eventually the king over all kings. Where it states that he emptied himself in verse 7 is pointing out going from the ultimate power and strength of being God to becoming a man of no reputation, no value, in human terms, what a step down that is. The base things of the world. You remember I taught on that from 1 Corinthians? The base things of the world we talked about in the other lessons. This is what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was willing to become. A cockroach, right? That's, that's when we look at it. Whoever the Savior was to be, he had to bear the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. What a load to bear. And this Savior would have to die physically and spiritually to accomplish and complete this goal. Jesus Christ, as a human being, died upon the cross, but Jesus Christ, the unique God-man, was experiencing a spiritual death we may never, we will never fully understand, wrap our finite minds around it, a spiritual death by being separated from God the Father while he paid the price for the sins of all mankind, while he was paying the price on that cross. The darkness that fell upon the earth while Christ was on the cross was the final phase of Operation Salvation. Of mankind. It was going into the final phase. Now, obviously, he had to uh, rise three days later from the tomb. We all, we know this. And he had to then later on ascend to heaven to the right hand of God to complete the mission. But the salvation phase and the, and the payment of sin was going on right here and now and during that cross, during that time of darkness. It's here the Lord Jesus Christ felt the most pain because he's separated from God the Father. Truthfully, that's what hell will be like. That's what hell will be like. You have, your friends ask what it's going to be like. Separation from God the Father. Separation from the Trinity, actually, right? Absent from any presence of God. Any help from the Holy Spirit. Any love, any protection. Absent. Unbelievers do not even realize that while they are here on earth, God is allowing them His presence in their lives. He still touches their lives in different ways. They don't give Him credit. They don't recognize that, but He does. Think about the air that they breathe, right? Even if they ignore him, God still gives them enough air to get through the day, water to drink. They just don't care, unbelievers. The second reason for the birth of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was to become the mediator. We pointed that out. Unbelievers have no clue as the depth of what Jesus Christ has done, that he is their mediator. He's not only just their Savior, he's their mediator. They'll scoff at that. Yeah, Jesus Christ, I know about him, the Savior. They have no idea the depth of who and what Jesus Christ is. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. For there is one God. There's not five gods in the sky that created all this. One. One God. And one mediator also between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. All. Right? Unlimited atonement. I taught on that. The statement that there is one God is ultimately true, yet we know there to be a trinity fully functional and constantly at work. Yes, a trinity, three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we're so blessed in this church age that we live in right now because we're indwelt by all three. All three. The trinity is one of those doctrines that Satan loves to, to distort, though. He likes to distract people from it. Because it points to the virgin birth we're studying in Matthew right now. If Satan can get you to doubt that Jesus Christ was the Savior and is God, remember that, and is God, and then the virgin birth, and all the points I'm getting at and teaching on 
and getting us into would appear to be false. They would just slowly fall apart. The first two points out of the four would not even matter if you doubt Jesus Christ is God, right? Wouldn't even matter if you doubt that. Savior and mediator are those first two points, first two reasons for the virgin birth. Then we're noting high priest and king. But you wouldn't even get through all that if you don't understand Jesus Christ is God. But in all this, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had to be willing to set aside his divine power. He had to make the ultimate sacrifice in so many ways, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So many ways he sacrificed. Philippians 2.7. You want to turn there, we'll get a couple of scriptures in Philippians 2, obviously. I went over some of them, but you want to look at them with your eye gate, as my pastor taught me over the years. You want to take a look at them. But emptied himself, right? He emptied himself. Kino, it's called in the Greek. Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Even death on the cross. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ emptied himself, that Greek verb, kinoo. This is a doctrine of Christ emptying himself. But really it's a voluntary setting aside of his divine power to accept human frailty. To accept it. Setting aside his power, saying, I won't use that. I won't use that. I'll get into this human flesh, this human body. And I'll, 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 I'll walk in my uniqueness as a man. It means to set aside. To cause something to be useless. Think about what he gave up. Think about all the things the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ sacrificed. The Lord Jesus Christ willingly, willingly came forth from the Trinity in eternity past and accepted the frailty of humanity, setting aside divine power for his earthly ministry. He never stopped being God. Never. Never once stopped being God. So don't let anybody tell, teach you that or tell you that. His miracle works, in fact, the healings and miracle works you saw during his three and a half year Ministry was a display of his deity, his power, but most of what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did in his human form was simply the power of the Holy Spirit, right, tapping into that, combined with the truth of Scripture, living in the Word. Guess what? We do that. We tap into the power of the Spirit, walk, walk in the new man, be imitators of Christ, and then we can have uh, Scripture in our soul structure if we, if we studied it, took it as serious, and moved forward and use it. Showing us we can use the same filling power of the Holy Spirit and His Word as a victory in this life if we want it. He, he laid the protocol plan down. He laid the blueprint down. That's your role model. Not some celebrity on TV. Not, as I always say, Kim and Kanye. Those aren't your, those aren't, those aren't your role models. If they are, you got a problem. you got a problem. The Lord Jesus Christ is the role model. Savior, mediator, high priest, and king needed to be filled by a human being. Otherwise, folks, otherwise... Prophecy, scripture itself, as well as God's divine standard, would crumble. It would crumble, fall apart, and Satan would love that, to pick it apart. That's what he tries to do. In other words, the depth of perfection, purity, righteousness, was such a high standard that no human or angel could fulfill it. Could not do it. And I mentioned that last lesson. Yet there was a human element needed to finish the four titles written in the scripture and, to, and, and that are designed in the plan of God. There's a human element needed in that. Only the Lord Jesus Christ could fill this. So unique. So concerning this title as high priest, it was special. It was sanctified position in the Old Testament. Some of you folks know this. To the high priest alone, it was permitted to enter the Holy of Holies, a tabernacle, which he did only once a year on the great day of atonement for the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. In Hebrews chapter 9, you can take a look at some of this. Hebrews chapter 9 covers this pretty well. And I'm only touching the surface with these four titles, but you can take a look at Hebrews 9, 11 together. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 9, go ahead, get a sip of my iced tea. Jump in there if you want, Hebrews chapter 9. In fact, I'll put Hebrews 9, 11 on the board for you. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come... Remember, we talk about a shadow, the Old Testament shadow, what was to come. He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation. There it is, right? There it is. Hebrews 9, 12. And not through the blood of what? Goats and calves. Not animal sacrifices, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal security. Eternal redemption. Only Jesus Christ could fulfill the shadow of the Old Testament 
prophecies concerning Savior, Mediator, High Priest, and King. Only Christ. The blood of innocent animals that dates back to the garden. Think about it. When the Lord killed the animals to make coverings for the original man and woman to cover their sins, it comes to a divine conclusion through Jesus Christ. Full circle. Full circle it comes around on the cross of Christ. Hebrews 9.15 For this reason he, Christ, is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And remember, God knew in eternity past what your decisions would be, those who have been called, okay? Eternity was hanging in the balance. This was no longer a shadow or promise of what was to come. The cross of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the divine conclusion. The divine conclusion. Only the Lord Jesus Christ could fulfill and bring this to a full circle divine conclusion. The standard in God's plan is so pure, so high, so righteous, that the blood of sacrifice on the altar has to be met to pass through the justice of God, the supreme court of heaven, the only courtroom that really matters. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands of human making, right? A mere copy of the true one. But into heaven itself. Into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for who? For us. What was I saying here earlier? The joy set before him was us. To endure the shame, the pain of the cross. Was us. Hebrews 9, 25, 26 goes on to tell us the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ offers himself up one time as a sacrifice for sins for all of us. It was the completion. It was done and over with. It met, it met the standard in heaven. One time, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ completed the whole payment for sins. Debt paid. Stamp it. Mark it. Stamp it paid. Done. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ, also, having been offered once, once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Now this obviously points to the second coming, the second advent of Christ. Hebrews 5, 6. Take a look at this. Just as he says in another paragraph, uh, passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Some of you guys know this stuff from, from uh, if you've ever done a study on Abraham in the Old Testament. Melchizedek appeared to have no beginning or no ending. You also see this noted in Psalm 110, uh, uh, verse 4. This was the king and high priest of an area called Salem in the ancient world, not the crazy Salem down the highway here in the New England area. Um, and even Abraham, like I said, if you studied him, he paid tithes to this man, showed respect to this man. It's a powerful man of God, Melchizedek. But it appears like this guy, Melchizedek, appears out of nowhere, right? No parents, no beginning, no ending. It appears he never died. But we know he's human. So there's an analogy there for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the Lord, just Jesus Christ, fulfills this unique description of Melchizedek. Very interesting how the Lord fills all these, every description, every prophecy, every scripture. Then Jesus Christ came on the scene to fill the role of king in the royal line of David. Those of you who know anything about King David, the royal line, Jesus Christ. Matthew 21, 5, say to the daughter of Zion, behold... Your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a beast of a burden. It's also obviously noted John 12, uh, 15 I put on here. And in the Old Testament, right, the, the uh, prophecy, Zechariah 9, 9. Remember, both Joseph and Mary had bloodline, blood ties, their bloodline ran to the house of David. Their bloodlines came from that. That alone puts the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in royal human bloodline. And not just any line, but that of King David. Fulfilling prophecy once again. And you can look at uh, the branch that's mentioned. Jeremiah 23, 5, Zechariah 6, 12. Meaning the branch that's going to shoot off from uh, the line of David. Speaking of Jesus Christ, his royalty. Revelation 17, 14. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Because he is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And those who are with him are the called and the chosen and faithful. You and I, believers, brothers and sisters. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord over all lords, king over all kings. It is his title. There is no king greater, no president, no monarchy greater. It is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 16. 
And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. The number of fulfilled prophecies, I was thinking about this and I jotted it down before I set this message up. The number of fulfilled prophecies about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is over 300. I believe 235 are exactly fulfilled, exactly to the letter, precisely done. The others fall under analogies that reference Christ and his earthly ministry, but all have come to pass. All of them come to pass. So some of them are analogies using David, if you get into Psalms and Proverbs and different stuff like that, um, and different types of analogies about Christ and his ministry and who he was. But it's, it's amazing. 300 prophecies fulfilled. It's it, to the letter. All have come to pass. All. Not one has gone, uh, you know, uh, uh, and not. And we're in the age now, the church age we're living in, there's really no more prophecy to be fulfilled. You have the rapture. We can look for foundational principles, which I taught on in my book, Discerning Our Time, uh, that are going to set the tribulation, the foundation being laid, which has been being laid, actually, for quite a long time. And here in America, like I said in my book, Discerning Our Time, I cover it from the early 1900s, where there's obviously influence from um, evil uh, outside forces all over the place, from Europe, a lot of it. A lot of it having to do with what we call the Illuminati families. Um, they don't even know they're being used, or maybe they do, because you find out the different satanic stuff that they're into. But um, those type of prophecies, all prophecy being fulfilled, Christ fulfilled all the prophecies when he came on the cross. Unbelievable. And especially when he completed his mission from in the tomb for three days, right? Then he, then he rises out of the tomb. And then he, he goes amongst the people and he converts even more people. And then the ascension up to heaven. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father. Everything fulfilled. So in this day and age, if you're looking for prophecy to be fulfilled, it's all done. Waiting for the rapture of the church. That's it. We can look at things that are going to happen in the tribulation. And say, oh, I see this being set up and that being set up. And one world banking, one world order, one world government, a lot of that kind of stuff which I always find interesting, and I talk on it sometimes and teach on it, just to wake people up. But uh, if you're a believer, you know where you're going. No fear. No worries. Keep everybody in prayer, and I don't know what happened in California, but it uh, didn't sound like a good thing by the time I got off the news and got uh, uh, down here to my little studio. So keep it all in prayer. Uh, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we had, and let your message go out to a lost and dying world through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.